Hello, this is Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and you have joined us for another episode of The View. We'll be talking about collaborative leadership today, always a good topic. And we have with us D. Vandiver, Vandiver, V. D. D. Anyway, <laughs> D. Good old D. D. Vandiver, 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 said it right Vandiver. I said it right the first time. Um, who has recently moved from New Orleans up to live near Jessica Star Rocker. So three out of- Expressly to live right near me. <laughs> That's right. She needed to live near Jessica. So uh, <laughs> most of us today are coming from the Seattle area. Aisha, how are you? Uh, good morning. I'm good. So the um, I did run and get coffee and the, the Seahawks apparently like I took over Starbucks. So that's the sleeve. Um, I'm good. Uh, traffic was a little goofy. I'm in my office. So we were all up. Our West Coasters were up at the crack of uh, dawn this morning, right? So I'm doing well. I'm in Seattle. Actually, I'm in Bellevue. Michael, how are you? I'm doing okay this morning, Aisha. It's good to be with you all. It's been a hard couple of days here. Joining you from Peekskill, New York, where I was also up at the crack of dawn. That was just three hours ago. So... Yeah, with a child or a dog. Yeah, dawn, dawn is a meaningless concept. Well, before we um, launch into conversation about collaborative leadership, I think we all wanted to talk about um, the horrific events that happened during the board meeting and, and are why our other host, um, Christiana Rivera, is not here today. Um, she is taking well-needed self-care time to do some healing and um, I want to say how angry I am. And I keep thinking about this book that I read, written by a Black anti-apartheid activist in South Africa, who described how while he was being tortured, he was using scripture that he loved to keep himself sane, that the torturers, who were white Christians, were using the same scripture to justify their behavior. And I just want to name that any faith can be used in horrific ways. And when people say this is not Unitarian Universalism, most regrettably, uh, for some people, it appears to be very deeply part of what Unitarian Universalism means to be racist, that to have the freedom to be racist. Um, I think that everybody here would absolutely ch uh, challenge that and say that really actually get out of here, you're not. But uh, if you read the principles and purposes, but certainly our history and current events continue to say, this is, appears to be for some people an essential part of who we are, that without white supremacy, we maybe can't exist in their minds. So, um, you know, that's why we do this show, to talk from other perspectives, to offer up other perspectives about how vibrant and multicultural this faith actually is so much stronger when it is. So. I don't know what other people might want to say about uh, what happened. Aisha, I know you were at the board meeting. Uh, yeah, I was uh, there. I'm I'm uh, the current chair of the nominating committee of the UUA, and we all happened to convene in Boston at the same time. So um, I was uh, called, asked, to, Christina asked to, for me. So I went and sat with her. So I was in a rage. I mean, I definitely can't. That That really is still kind of simmering. Uh, that that her child was targeted uh, to get to her. And the, the first thing that I said to Susan Frederick Gray is, you know, now is the time. And now I have what there's three ministers here and, and Jessica will be a minister that you all say to each other. If you see something, say something. Somebody knows about someone's obsession with Christina. This is not the first time she's gotten written hate mail. Um, clear. I, mean, I didn't even realize the youth were going to be in Boston the same weekend we are. So somebody's paying really, really close attention to what's happening. And as far as I'm concerned, like, you know, pay attention to, to what people are saying and how angry and how um, maybe fixated they are on whether it was, you know, the actual Southern regional job or, I mean, at this point we need to become more um, practical and uh, diligent. Uh, and, and someone called it, we, the POC caucus in Boston, someone called it terrorism. And that's what it feels like because it's meant to strike fear. Uh, and, and so we need to treat it as we, we need to pay more attention to the people who are coming to us uh, in distress, not over racism, but over using, you know, the displacement of what they perceive as a displacement of the dominant culture. 
So if I can give any message this morning, it's that it's not only, I have no doubt this is a UU um, and it's now up to, you know, all of us to be mandated reporters. If there's someone that's a little too fixated on, on the words white supremacy to the point where it's becoming disturbing, then it probably is. And we, and we need to treat it as such. So that, that's what I have to say about it. Well, and, you know, just to add uh, from, from my perspective, I, it makes me sad. It makes me furious. It, um, it does not make me surprised. And when you say it's terrorism, I think it's also meant to re-traumatize every person of color in our movement who has received, I mean, not necessarily hate mail, but comments and racist garbage um, flung at them. And it's every person of color in Unitarian Universalism has, to, has had to deal with that. Um, and so, you know, when, when something like this happens so publicly and so obviously horrendous, um, people out there need to know that it's the tip of the iceberg, right? It's, um, it's the obviously horrendous that is standing in right now for all of the horrible, horrible ways in which people of color in Unitarian Universalism are treated every day, every Sunday, every meeting. Um, and so, yeah, not surprised. And, you know, it makes me sadder that I'm not surprised, but furious. So all of our hearts are surrounding Christina and her whole family. Um, and I love the, if you see something, say something used in this way, right? I mean, um, it, it is, it is really time to start naming this as it's progressing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's infuriating. It's, it's infuriating. I think all of us have the impulse to just go down and stay, at least I do, go down and just sit in front of Christina's house and just go, oh yeah, come through me, you know? Um, and so how do we do that for each other, given that we're not physically able to do that? Social media is certainly one place where we can respond to the, to the little crap that goes on all the time. And we who are white and those who are male and other people who have privilege Really, it's on us. It's on us to be the first responders. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so our hearts are with Christina. Christina, if you're watching this, we love you um, and your family. And uh, roots failed. Dee, were you going to say something? I just wanted to lift up, I mean, deep care, Christina and Asia, right? I mean, you were in fact a very first responder, right, in that moment. Um, and at General Assembly 2017, um, the friends and families of Louisiana's incarcerated children in their offering plate received hate mail. Um, and so we, Ruth and I, Ruth Adakula, who's the executive director of the Center for Ethical Living and Social Justice Renewal, we've been talking for a minute about how it's not them, it's us, right? And how th this is deeply a conversation for Unitarian Universalists, um, because there is a kind of that um, that city on the hill, you know, like we're a beacon of faith in this way, um, and and that's a part of our history and a part of our story. But we're also very much right, like our faith was created within systems of oppression, so they're not outside of us, um, and that I feel like is such a it's the conversation we're having right now in this way. Um, but it feels really important, not just to be sad that, you're not, that we're not surprised, but to like be intentional, like, okay, this is happening. This is us. Is this how we're called to be as a people of faith, right? See, I don't wanna lose that point. So at General Assembly, where what, 4,000 UUs assembled and the offering plate happened there where where hate mail was is that was that what you said yeah that i don't want that to be lost so it was hate mail to the children of incarcerated people it was about it, i actually i wrote an article for it so it's on um the quest 
but it's, it's not them, it's us. Um, and there's a picture of what was written in the envelope because they do a special collections envelope. So still, so it was at, it was clearly a Unitarian Universalist, right? There's no question of, it could have come from outside. Like it was us, we're the ones who did this, right? Um, and so it just feels really important to own that in a way that isn't like, oh, well then, well then it's all bad and we don't wanna do anything about it, but like, okay, so this is us and we're faith, this is our faith, what are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna be together? Jessica, um, hopefully you can post that link to Dee's blog about that hate mail. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I know <clears throat> before the UUA got serious about homophobia, um, they did the survey to people who said things like Hitler had the right idea, they should have killed them all and things like that. And it was that survey that woke people up to going, what Dee just said, it's not them, it's us about homophobia. And when I look at what has happened in my lifetime about addressing homophobia within Unitarian Universalism, it's amazing. So we did it. <laughs> Which queer people were okay is a whole nother question, but we, we have done this and we have, I mean, people took that seriously enough to really address it, to create an office, to create a program, to really um, take seriously that it was us. And um, this, the, not only, uh, I liked what Tim Atkins, who's a board member wrote about how surprised everybody is. And everyone's like, are you sure? Is it a UU? Could it be someone else? And um, I think surprise and, innocence is, is a privilege that um, we don't get to have. <laughs> I mean, not if we want to claim to be at all conscious. And so when people, I was saddened by all of those surprised people um, about how surprised they were because we, as Michael said, we're hearing these stories all the time, not, not hate mail to someone's child, but hateful things said to people, hateful events transpiring when people of color are hired, hate, you know, hateful, stupid remarks made in coffee hour. Um, so at some point, we who are white have to say, okay, no more, no more innocence, no more, no more pleading innocence on this. Deal with it. Deal with it. We who are white just need to deal with it. And I hope that's part of what this show can do is lift up ways that people are um, positively trying to create change in our movement. And, um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff going on. I appreciated Susan Frederick Gray's quick response and public outcry. Um, I appreciate the work that the board is doing. You know, there, there's good stuff going on. And those of us in the you know in the outfield we need to be supporting the good leadership that's there i think the other problem with the whole um surprise is it, it feels like gaslighting poc it's like enough with the pretending this doesn't go on uh because that makes me angry too it's like that's it's not only a point of privilege it's a it's a way of, of minimizing and, and it, to me, it's a form of, of gaslighting. Well, you know, some, I, actually one comment I read was something like, well, it, people are trying to cause divisiveness among us. And I'm like, A, we're not that important. Sorry but to break it to you. No one's spending that much time. It's us. It, it, there are people that are just really afraid of sitting in discomfort and how, we, you know, one of the things that, that I think it's important for us to grapple with is how we've, how our communities exist in the world, Unitarian Universalism, right? So, so when we're at our best, I, when, when um, Dee, I know you helped uh, lead this effort with Jolanda when the, when the two uh, UUA employees were attacked by the four really youth, um, you, you showed up in mass in court for restorative justice. That, that's when we are at our best. That's when we're at our best. And when we're at our most, to me, challenging is when all we want to do is control the language in the worship, don't want children to make noise, 
when we really want it to be white centered in New England and, 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 and really speak to the comfort of one group of people. And that's when I think we've done that for a very long time. So now this discomfort is it's white fragility on steroids. It's we can't do any, you know, we're the good people. Were you used? We marched in the 60s. Th that should count for something. I've literally heard more than once. Were you used? And that should count for something. So, so it's it's more than it's it's more insidious than privilege. It is gaslighting, and it's an it's a it's, it is a privilege, and it's a sense of entitlement that simply causes more harm and more damage. Because then we have to spend time saying, no, this is actually us. This, yep, this is Unitarian Universalism. Yep, we, as Michael said, this is stuff we hear all the time. So, I mean. To be clear, this is not the first time I've known someone of color whose children have received hate mail. I mean, in Unitarian Universalism. Uh, so like even that part of the outrage, like it's not the first time I know of that people's children have been attacked uh, for their parents being leaders in, in people of color movements. Um, you know, I also, I don't want to lose the fact that so this outrageous thing happened and I was very appreciative of Susan Frederick Ray's quick and forceful uh, and clear uh, denunciation of it. Um, and I hope um, that, that UUA leadership is taking seriously what we need to do to, to really address this in our congregation, I hope in our congregations. And at the same time at this board meeting, Drum also came to Boston to ask for funding, and we're told, yeah, we're not so sure. So, um, you know, I just, I want to hold that up too, because like people can be, you know, forceful and um, uh, clear in the, in rhetoric and, you know, the funding needs to follow the rhetoric. Uh, the funding for anti-racism work. Jim Crivar Graham has written this on our on our Facebook feed. Uh, the funding for anti-racism work needs to follow. The funding for people of color organizing in in our faith needs to follow. The funding for pastoral care for people of color in our movement needs to follow. Um, and you know we're quick with words, so it's my personal challenge to be to be quick with institutional support as well. I read a blog this week. Uh, well, it was a Facebook post by someone I didn't know that was shared by Leslie Mack that was about a black woman who was going into the trunk of her own car and a white guy came along and just said like, what are you doing? And she thought, why on earth should I respond to this idiot and ignored him and kept dealing with what she was looking for in her own trunk of her own car. And he called the police. And, um, and I thought, you know, how many times have I seen white people challenge people of color in Unitarian Universalist circles about what they're doing, <laughs> about whether they belong, about whether they're really you, you, about, I mean, the say, I mean, it was such an appalling example of entitlement and, um, white supremacy, but I thought, but I see that. I see that very thing going on a lot where people's legitimacy to be Unitarian Universalist is challenged, their legitimacy in churches, um, you know, and so if, we, <laughs> yeah, I've just watched it my whole life and yeah, I need I need to step up my game. I need to figure out how to step up my game because I yeah, it's it's um it's just so persistent. It's so it's the 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 whiteness, I mean it, compared to what we've done with homophobia where we we've actually changed our culture about it. I mean, Michael, you and I are queer ministers. Who cares? It's not even I mean, I don't know. It seems like almost all the ministers are queer one way or another. I mean, it's just not a thing. And if you're white, if you're white, it's not a thing. So it just, yeah, we can do better. I know we can do better. D. You had flagged for me, Ruth Adakla, who's the executive director of the Center for Ethical Living and Social Justice Renewal, 
the, the center is housed inside of a UU congregation and for at least the first year, whenever she was encountered by a white person in the hall, she would be asked that polite phrase, can I help you? You know that one, right? Um, it's taking, it takes a lot of cultures, like real, like a real shift. I was thinking, Michael, when you were talking about um, those, um, the things that have happened, just the history of them. And Asia, when you're talking about the gaslighting, like so often when these stories are told, the, res the immediate response from white folk is, are you sure? Mm -hmm. um, really? That's not possible. Um, and so mm -hmm. just an invitation, Meg, as you're talking about how we need to change our game, like to notice if those words come out of your mouth, you've just done that, right? And, and to end that moment, be like, okay, let me, you know, let's, acknowledge in this moment that this that, that this is how I'm being part of it. Um, so I think that so much of the learning is like to really know like what those things are, you know, like it's a whole set of skills that white folk have not been taught on purpose, right? That it, it's, it's, our, it's our work to go find out like, wait, how am I upholding the status quo in this moment? How am I perpetuating harm in this moment? Um, and just some, yeah, like we can, we can learn to do better, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is a, a sense of fatalism about white supremacy in our faith sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you've lifted up Meg that, that we have shifted our culture around some very particular oppressions and we can do it again. Um, there's a lack of faith around it somehow. But I wonder if there, if it's really shifting, like what happened, it's true with the LGBT community, it's for the white LGBT community uh, ministers. Um, but I wonder if, if the ask this time or the demand is different. It's decentering what has been the center of this whole country um, because we are a part of this country. Entire universalism is very much rooted in, in United States history. And... I, I am not fatalist. I think we can change. It's going to take a lot more um, uh, courage because, again, we have our spiritual leaders, um, you know, religious educators are grappling with this. We, you know, we try to talk to each other, have difficult conversations. And I think that's where, you know, collaborative leadership can be a good thing. I mean, the, the idea of holding on to this notion of, um, there's only one way to do something because of, uh, you know, a list of credentials, and then and then really a different way doesn't even gets discounted, um, isn't helpful to our faith. So I think we we have the ability to do it. Do we have the will? Because it's a different ask. Decentering whiteness is 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 important for humanity and the earth, frankly, um, and it's a monumental ask for people who are so used to being in comfort. I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's a different ask than what happened with the L because people have LGBT, you know, folks in their families and you look like us. So uh, I don't, I, I think it was, yes, there's rampant homophobia and yes, it was difficult. I'm not minimizing that. I'm saying it's a different ask because you're both still white, right? Yeah. So let's bridge into how is collaborative leadership part of the antidote to oppression? Because I think these things are connected, right? Um, and I'm suspecting that since Dee and Aisha are working on a book on this topic, it's going to be very connected. So I'd love to hear how you decided to do this book and, and how you do, because certainly that one right way is one of the cornerstones of white supremacist culture and thinking, right? There's only one right way to do it, and it's the white way. So um, anyway, I'd love to hear how you decided to do this book and, and how you think it's connected to this conversation. So when uh, Dee and I met, I don't even know when, uh, I suggested the book Salsa, Soul and Spirit um, about multicultural leadership written by Juana Bordas. And, and I just kind of threw it out there and then a few, uh, some time passed and then Dee sent me an email uh, saying, thank you so much, I love this book. And then we kind of would have tiny, com tiny you know, conversations every now and then over the next few months. And then um, I really just, and then we started doing it at East Shore. We have an executive team model. It came out of necessity because we had no minister for nine months. And it, we have, we're a 400 member church. We didn't have an associate minister. We didn't have a senior minister. So the collaboration had to happen out, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. We didn't invent collaborative leadership, but it had to happen. 
And so um, I, I think it was just Deanna and I said, you know, we need to put this out there because I think one of the questions people have is, well, how would this work? Well, who's in charge? That's the big question. Who's in charge? How would this work? We need somebody to be in charge. And, and that's true. And we will grapple with that. It's not that it's a perfect thing, but it's saying th this notion that we have only one person um, who is, has the answers for everything also hurts that person. Like, I think it sets that person up for uh, what, D, I want you to speak to the notion of how we've estranged ministers and then given them power because you, you spoke to it so beautifully. And I think we need to see each other as, as humans trying to learn how to be human together. You know, who said that Alice Walker. Um, so I'll, I'll throw it over to you, D. At the same time that Asia was saying, here's this thing. And I was like, what is this thing? Um, at the Center for Ethical Living and Social Justice Renewal, I had been the executive director and Ruth Adakala had been the office manager and it was not working. It just wasn't working. It was too hard. It was weird. Like there's this woman who knows so much about so much and how am I her boss? It was just, it wasn't, it was not good. Um, and so we were, you know, we had a staff retreat and we're working with someone, uh, Pam Nath, who's this wonderful facilitator. And she said, I'm going to throw a bomb in the situation, but have you thought about co-directorship? And we looked at each other and I mean, I just felt just this weight lift up and I was like, oh, that makes so much more sense than what we're doing now. Um, and so for the two, over two years, we were co-directors together until um, my partner and I've been bi-coastal for 10 years. And so finally it was time to move out West and get great neighbors like Jessica Starr. <laughs> um, but the process, I mean, and every day it was process, right? Like collaborative leadership, it is for true uh, uh, a faith practice. Like it is deep spiritual practice. Um, and I feel like a better human being. <laughs> um, the work is deeply faithful um, and it's rich. Like there were things we were able to co-create out of a collaborative leadership that just could not happen in a hierarchical structure. Um, and like the conversations that we were able to have and the way that we were together able to unpack a lot of the systemic racism around us and within us. I mean, you know, often our staff meetings were out loud talking about how white supremacy was showing up, internalized superiority, internalized inferiority. Um, and so really doing that, that work of the work started peeling the white supremacy out of the larger structures that we were working in. Um, and, you know, I've, give thanks to the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Um, their undoing racism training, I've tried to go to at least once a year for, gosh, almost a decade mm -hmm. now. Um, and I, and I, every time I go, I'm like, oh yeah, right. Because every day white supremacy gets re-inscribed in me, right? Every day the world looks at me and is like, oh, here you go, white lady. Um, and so it's really important, right? For me to keep getting that reminder and in a collaborative leadership, it was really clear, like who would, you know, people would walk into the office and be like, oh, you must be the person in charge, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we developed all kinds of strategies. And this is a part of that collaborative leadership piece that I think is really important for dismantling white supremacy. Like Ruth became the person who signed the checks. So if you wanted to get paid, you had to talk to the black lady in the room, not the white lady, right? So to really change power dynamics, but we had to really talk about what was happening so that we could understand those dynamics. And I think that is so much the power of white supremacy um, is that it silences what's really happening, right? Um, and I think when we talk about Asia and I have talked about ministry um, and how, you know, so much of the shaping of, of ministerial formation comes out of these structures, right? That the, the, the that the country has been built on. And, um, and so when you, I, you know, I just, so many colleagues I've talked to are lonely and just deeply sad. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a isolation that happens when you have this structure that says you have this kind of power and you have to be in this kind of relationship, but it's not faithful. Like it's not, um, the covenantal right relationship that we talk about as Unitarian Universalists. Um, and so that dichot, that, that break, I think is a part of our struggle um, congregationally, institutionally, that we have these structures in place that, we're, that hold oppression inside of them. Um, and so this is an invitation um, to, to play, right? Um, because there has to be joy in it. It really, 
um, what Ruth and I found was that so long as we were intentional about being in right, like being joyful with each other, this was possible. It's very, you know, very possible. There wasn't much joy in this structure. I was very clear about this. Um, this was a lot of work, but so much more joyful. And I just, I want to invite people. I know a lot of folks think about anti-racism work and they're like, oh God, it's so hard. It's like, yeah, it's hard, but it's fun. I mean, it can really be when you're in right relationship with someone, there's just, if you think about all the, Kathleen um, is a member of a congregation in New Orleans and she talks about how uh, as a white woman, she knows that there's ways that she just can't be in relationship with the black women she works with because of the structure that's held in place, right? Um, and how much of their humanity gets lost onto each other because of the hierarchical structure that's set up and the oppression that's in there. Um, uh, I can go on and on, but I just am so grateful to have this opportunity and that there are so many examples in our faith right now of folk who are collaborating um, across the spectrum. You know, we're looking at you, Southern Region, we're looking at you, UUA, we're looking at you, UUMA, Ministers Association. I mean, it's happening. And so there are actually stories to collect, which is really exciting. And I think you also, the important, so the part, how we do anything is how we do everything. And that's a Zen phrase. I did not make that up. And I think the, the invitation, as, as Dee said, is for us to, to, to learn how to do anti-racism work by genuinely dismantling the systems that are keeping racism firmly in place. And collaborative leadership is one way to do that. It is not easy. It is absolutely not easy. And it is a way, and, and neither is, you know, dismantling racism by saying please and thank you isn't working. And so it's not working in our systems. It's not working. So it's more, okay, well then, you know, no one wants, I don't want to get rid of the Unitarian Universalist Church. I, I, I you know, I, I believe in our faith and I believe we can live more fully into who we think we want to be, who I know we want to be, uh, but not, we're not there. And, and this top-down structure. I mean, I've heard ministers say it's, it's, it's not going to work. People need, to, well, I, oh, here's the other good one I get. Well, I went to seminary and I learned all these things and I'm the one who understands what, um, you know, what holds everything together. And basically there's also this um, notion that <laughs> I'm almost like, I'm not a moron. No, I did not go to seminary. I, I mean, I have other things that I bring to the table and so do other religious educators and musicians and administrators to make the church go forward. Um, so if we can just get a little dose of humility along with uh, the invitation, that would be great. But I'd love to hear from Michael and Meg, because I think Dee and I could just take up this whole time. Well, it's really exciting. You know, I'm, I'm doing this little collaborative ministry, interim ministry out in the suburban church here that had no applicants for interim. So, you know, I'm only 60% at CLF, so I had some spare time and Keith you know, asked me if I'd think about doing 50% there and holding it together. And I said, no, not at all, but I'll put together a team. And so Arif Mamdani is 50%, Terry Bernor is 25%, and I'm 25%. And we have said to each other, we meet weekly. Every week, we just say, this is so fun together and would be so impossible alone because, you know, we don't know the people. We're there temporarily. We're trying to help strengthen and change a lot of systems that either are in place or aren't in place. And it would be really lonely, you know? And so, you know, it, we're in a weird position because we're gonna kind of come and go and we don't want to um, set up whoever comes in. But, you know, I've thought about this, like I would, I would do much more interim ministry in teams. I would, I would love to do that, but doing it solo, no, I don't want to do that. It's, it's too, uh, it is a setup for everybody. It's too lonely. It's too hard. Um, and I, I think that, as you said, Aisha, how you do anything is how you do everything. Or as this friend of mine used to say in therapy all the time, the patterns, the patterns, the pattern, you know? And so I think that even though our congregations and Ruth Reinhardt has said that congregational and ministry hierarchy contributes to these challenges, yes. But I think that you know, we just did this other thing. And of course they had no applicants. So they, they, we were all they had. So they said, yes. And I think we call ourselves the Troika because there's three of us and that's like three horses pulling a wagon. 
I guess also the Troika form, the KGB, it turns out, but whatever, it's still a good name. <laughs> but anyway, to me, I mean, I feel like CLF is a very collaborative environment, but I still am the senior minister. And I, you know, I've been really challenging. Um, the, the pay structures are so unjust. And, and I know, I understand student loan debts, and I'm so privileged not to have them. And I understand clergy needing to get pay them off and that that's a huge thing but I still and I because I was a DRE first and I thought it was unfair then <laughs> I still do I mean I think you know I'm not I'm not for being big co-ops but I do feel like um, as Aisha said people bring in really different skills from each other it's not like there's there's so many skill sets necessary in a congregation so that's that's what I could chime in Michael how about you well and I can say that um, I yearn for a team. Uh, you know, I'm, I serve a small congregation. And so, you know, I'm the only full-time person on the staff. We have a half-time DRE that I'm very privileged to work with um, as uh, on many collaborative things. But I yearn for a team. And, and D, you're so right that it's fun. Even when it's more work, it's, it's joyful to actually have people who are your partners in creating things in the congregation. And, you know, I have long, uh, I've, I'm in my 12th year here, and I have long said that, you know, I consider the congregation my team um, because I don't have other, uh, you know, I don't have other full-time people here. So, you know, it's a way of breaking down that hierarchy that, that Ruth, talked about no I'm I get paid to focus on this but but the congregation is my team um and you know it's it's interesting that people say oh I went to seminary you know, I took a half credit class in church administration in seminary that was useless let me just label it useless um nothing that I know about nonprofit management or leadership came from seminary right I have a certificate in nonprofit management that I have because I was a program staff member at a large congregation and they thought it was valuable for me to study nonprofit management. And so they paid for me to get, to get that certificate at Duke. It did not come from seminary, right? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I know about leadership and team building because I worked for six years on the UUA headquarters staff that did not come from seminary. Uh, and so you know, I work, you know, the, the religious educator I work with has a master's degree in conflict transfer, transformation. Like she knows more about systems theory in her little finger than I've ever studied, especially in seminary. Um, so like, why wouldn't I be a team? Like, why wouldn't I wanna be on a team? Um, and so we're working in Westchester on, on creating cross congregational teams because there are five congregations in this county and four of them are small. Um, and so we're thinking, can we break down some of those walls? And so we're, we're planting some seeds now um, here. We're actually doing a cross congregational uh, faith formation experiment uh, this year, which is fun, but it, it, it means there are three of us, two ministers and one religious educator who are working on a team to implement this program together. And it, fun, it's fun. It is more fun than doing it by myself. And it's also the, the gift of thinking differently than how we've been doing it. It, it doesn't have to be that the, you know, the religious educator, the, the executive director and the minister report to the board. It could be exactly what you said, this collaboration across congregations. So we see each other as connected. And, and the thing I wanna lift up, so, so a couple of weeks ago, the Commission on Institutional Change convened 30 people for a collaboratory. Uh, I was one of them. I was incredibly honored to be invited. And one of the things we had a design, I think they're going to write about it at some future date. But one of the things that I brought up was one of the things that I think is the most heartbreaking that I see is this. And I think I think this is what Ruth Reinhardt's speaking to is the congregation um, ministerial authority hierarchy is somewhere in our history a congreg either and i don't know what chicken or the egg it doesn't matter either a congregation hurts a minister or vice versa and then the minister's on guard against the congregation and that to keep from being hurt and that pattern just repeats itself since like i don't even know 1950s and then 
there's this inherent distrust, even in kind of the process of getting a minister. Now I'm, you know, in the whole, just, I mean, yes, it could be joyful and there's celebration, but there's also just this immediate, um, almost, um, it's almost like signing on to an NFL team. I mean, there, there's just, and, and it's like, I understand the practical implications of that and why it needs to happen. But I also wonder, like, what if really we saw each other as on a journey together as Unitarian Universalists and that the, the minister and the congregation see themselves as working together um, and, and empower each other and learn from each other. As, as you said, Michael, I think there's, a, there's value in seeing the invitation as broader than, than one dynamic. Go ahead, Dee. I was just going to say, I had the great fortune to have a wonderful mentor through my fellowshipping process. You may have heard of the Reverend Meg Riley. Um, <laughs> and she offered me these two bits of wisdom that I just forever, um, love the people you serve and do not isolate. And I think that collaborative leadership really speaks to the power of that wisdom um, that, that it really does call forth. I mean, you can love abstractly, but to love in relationship is a whole nother it's a whole nother level of connection, right? And Ruth and I, Ruth Adakal and I were just speaking yesterday about how so much of what systemic uh, oppression, white supremacy has done is it, it has broken, it, it has not allowed relationships to be present or to be authentic. Um, and so a lot of this um, invitation in this collaborative conversation is an opportunity to develop real relationships. Um, and to be really present because that's that's when that not that surface not the surface love but the like you know I like I I am for you you know I'm not just like abstractly think you're a good idea I'm like I believe in the cells of you the very the very real of you you know and because of that I'm turned turned towards you right in this way. So that, that whenever, whenever people, this, we were talking about leadership for, for isolation, you know, when leaders have a lot of power and get isolated from the people they serve, you know, very seldom do good things come of that. Um, and so just wanted to lift up like, those two powerful pits, bits of wisdom and how they really nourish this conversation. I wanna name that Allies for Racial Equality, I'm not sure who's the person behind that name, who's writing, but, we, we need to have you guys on. You need to come and talk about the good work you're doing with congregations and others. But they've written a couple of things um, that they have moved to a fully collaborative leadership model. And it's a whole different organization, much more effective and, yes, more joyful. It's also important to think about decision making. We move to consensus, which invites all affected parties to have a say in what affects them. And then Jim, again, too often the search committees of churches are informed by the congregation's pain. And, and that is certainly true. And, and, you know, I think that the healing has to happen um, for congregations and for clergy to move on. You know, I, I almost think clergy should have to do interims before they move to a new congregation um, just because of the trauma that, I think Asia was saying it, it happens and then it gets reinforced and then the fear sets in and, and anytime someone wants to give you feedback, it's scary instead of helpful and, you know, and the, and the relationship is really broken. So um, yeah, how to, how to, how to bind up the wounds and keep moving forward is, is uh, I think what's fun about intro ministry is figuring, figuring that out. So, um, oh, A, right, A, R, oh, I'm sorry, I'm saying the wrong thing. Racial equity, not racial equality. I apologize. That is a distinction. Those are two different things, and racial equity is the correct name. So thank you for correcting me on that. I think I was back in 1987 or something right there. So thank you. Um, so, that, you know, this is so exciting. And, and I wonder, I, it seems connected to me, Brock Leach, who's working now with the UUA and CLF to do entrepreneurial stuff. He met with the CLF board when we just met. And he said something I thought was so interesting. He said, 
you know, a lot of ministers really don't quite get entrepreneurial ministry, but most religious educators get it immediately. <laughs> and I just thought that was so telling about who people are and, um, and also about where to find support for, for where to find real partners in work. I think sometimes people don't find partners because they're looking in the wrong places to find the partners. Um, so I'm curious, Asia. Yes, you look like well, you have something to say a, about I that. Took, I took a um, Brock Leach and Emily Detert. I'm forgetting her last full name. Detar uh, Burt. Detar Burt. Uh, both led an entrepreneurial. Uh, so he said that to us. So it was mostly religious educators. I think I'm, I'm not even sure if there was, except for Brock and Emily, uh, ministers in the room. But he, at the end of it, I mean, we were so like right there. And he's uh, actually there were a couple ministers in the room. But he said, um, "Wow, religious educators like." There was no needing to convince like it was just we jumped right in and that was actually also the seed of wanting to make actually um it would be great to turn this collaborative uh leadership book into a training and actually it was supposed to be a training first and i'm like let's do a book but it's in the formation plato stage right now for either thing but um you know it, it, it he, he brock was open to hearing because i said part of i think the challenge my suggestion was it's a, it's a little bit of a radical suggestion is to change our ministerial formation process. It's just, it's just rooted in this antiquated way of being, um, in, in, a, it being clergy. And I don't, I don't think it's a way that serves the person going through it or our faith. And so, you know, I don't, I, I of course have ideas on what that would look like, but I don't need to share them right now, but I think there's value in taking a look at what is it about how religious educators are uh, in congregations, um, that would lend it, you know, that we, that how we do things lends itself to being more excited or, or embracing entrepreneurial, uh, leader, um, models, uh, because I do think there's something in the formation process that creates almost fear embedded and doing the right thing, not breaking the covenant, um, making, you know, I think it's a fear-based process and I don't think it needs to be. Well, and I think, yeah. You know, I hear I hear what Brock says, and I think you know when you have less institutional power, you're probably more eager to to see things that undermine the ways that our institutional power uh, is distributed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my guess is ministers of of color and transgender ministers understand entrepreneurial ministry better than white and cisgender ministers do too. Um, so. You know, a lot of this has to do with with the ways that we distribute power. And what what I hear you, Asia and Dee, saying is part of this is about intentionally undermining the patriarchal, white supremacist ways that we that we do power. I think you know when you think about the equation for racism, right? race prejudice plus systemic power. But, but, and when you look at any kind of prejudice plus systemic power, that's how you get the, the ism, the oppression, right? So I think you're really, you're, you're pointing to power is a big part of this conversation. Um, and we've, ooh, what just can't, I'll just say it. What, we've been taught to hoard power, mm. right? Um, and uh, I think Brene Brown was talking about how scarcity is a, is a, a symptom of white supremacy is like PTSD. Um, Diana Dunn from the People's Institute talks about how way, way, way back um, in the frozen Northlands, if you didn't get your crops planted in time, you starved to death. And if you planted them too late, you starved to death because the frost came. Like, you know, that there is embedded in this certain type of whiteness, the sense of like the stakes are death, right? If I don't have the power, if I don't do this perfectly, if I don't, and that, that that's part of white supremacy culture. Um, and on some level, uh, maybe patriarchal culture, I'm not sure, but that um, this invitation, right, to, to open up how power is shared changes how things are created. It changes the shapes of institutions. I was talking to Jessica Star Rockers this morning about how part of the struggle for those of us who have become ministers through this particular faith formation process is that this is the process that affirmed that we're ministers. Right? So what does it mean to be a part of changing that process? Um, I think it means liberation. And I think that's the invitation. 
think that's what we're working towards. Jessica, are you writing instead of leaning over and saying something? I don't want to. I don't want to crowd. Come on, crowd the screen. I but she, but she, I do want to say that having gone through this process most recently and seen the MFC recently, that <laughs> that um, and I wrote this in the in the chat that that this conversation is actually so freeing to me as a, as a new minister because my instincts and what I have been you know, taught and what I've, the, some of the things that I have come to about shared ministry and collaborative leadership and, and how great that feels, building community in that way really does go against, those instincts go against what I have been told is the right way of being a minister. And some of these things to look out for of how to gain power, you know, in a, in a congregation and how to sort of protect it and really comes from so much fear and that's not how I feel about it and that's not what my instincts tell me so I already this is what three weeks now <laughs> since I saw the MFC but like really I I struggle with that um what do I listen to do I do I follow my instincts or do I listen to what people are telling me is sort of the right way to be a minister and how to like get on top of this thing you know like but thankfully D lives down the street so <laughs> Aren't I like, yeah, I'm super lucky. <laughs> Me too. Me too. But yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, Michael, maybe you can speak to that or Meg, you can speak to that. I'm going to encourage you to follow your instincts, Jessica. <laughs> I have it recorded now too. So I'll listen. And it's recorded. You can, I'll say it again, follow your instincts, share power, undermine the supremacist culture is, I mean, do it. Uh, you know, it's my instinct too. Um, and, you know, I think as I think about it, I learned more about this from working in a science lab whose primary investigator was a woman in the sciences um, than I did from seminary because um, that was that was the way she taught us to be scientists um, because people like to compete and hoard hoard knowledge and and power in that field too right um and it's why i don't say no when people ask me to be their preliminary fellowship mentors because <laughs> i think like those of us who have these instincts need to be the people who are teaching the, and mentoring the new ministers uh through this too so you know one day i will regret not saying no to, to people asking me to, to be their mentors through preliminary fellowship because like my entire week will be Zoom calls with, with my mentees. But um, so far I don't regret that at all. Uh, and uh, I so I'm gonna go on record as saying, trust your instincts if that's where your instincts are leading you. Jessica, I have no doubt in the world where your instincts are gonna lead you. <laughs> I know you too well, but um, I wanted to say R.K. Smith wrote that he were he or she, I don't know who R.K. or they, I don't know who R.K. Smith is. I worry that those who serve as interim ministers have a conflict of interest, disrupting the status quo will anger those in power and undermine their chances of getting their next post. What I love about being an interim minister is we keep saying we're pre-fired. We are pre-fired. Whether you love us or hate us, we're leaving. And so actually interim ministers have a lot of freedom that way. And way back when, I remember we used to say, interim ministry isn't a good time to jump into the anti-racism work because you're gonna leave. That is so wrong. I mean, we're pre-fired. It's a great time to bring it up. It's a great time to jump right in. And um, so I think there's a lot of freedom uh, as an interim minister and R.K. Smith, I'm curious if you are one, maybe you have a different experience, but um, I think it's a good chance to just reflect back what we see, which includes white supremacy and just be real about it. And we're pre-fired. And so there's, it, there's a lot less, you know, I'm not trying to get my kid through high school or something the way, you know, sometimes settled ministers are. I want to add to that, Meg, that uh, in my experience, just who I know and who I've seen and who my friends are and who my beloved colleagues are, um, that that sort of um, 
reputation for disrupting the status quo, for challenging uh, white supremacy, for challenging patriarchy, for challenging ableism, for challenging transphobia, does not follow white cisgender able-bodied ministers the way it follows people who are not all of those three. Um, uh, so I, I want to name that in our in our Unitarian Universalist system too, that 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 reputation sticks to people with less institutional power. Absolutely true at every turn. I mean, that is just true in every single kind of ministry, year of ministry, stage of professionalism, religious professionalism. Um, yes. Yes, that is absolutely true. So I think um, that is partly why, I mean, you know, on our team, Arif is a person of color. He's not the person bringing up white supremacy. Terry and I are, you know, so yeah, you ha that's why teams again are great because you can figure out who's the better person to say this, you know, and, and how, how will this be received differently if it comes from different people and, and how, you know, how do we move this forward? So, well, we're coming to the top of the hour and this has been a wonderful conversation. And um, I think we don't know what's happening next week, but something good will. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dee, for coming, for strolling up the road. And I'm excited. When are you thinking this book's gonna come out? Do you have a deadline? I mean, do you have a timeline? Now, yes, maybe. Uh, 2019. Okay. We're leaving it there, right, Dee? I think definitely won't have it ready for 2018. Can right. I make a request of all the ministers out there? When you all have your, whenever you're in UUMA chapters, whenever you're talking to your colleagues, please talk about disrupting white supremacy culture because there are a lot of uh, ministers who are also just as afraid as congregants. So I think if we can get our spiritual leaders on board, not everybody is. So that's my request. Thank you, friends. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.